snowy Reno, Nevada, as we welcome you into the 193rd edition of this particular poker vlog. If you watched the last one, you know things haven't been going all that well for me of late. I was actually kind of wondering about that, in all honesty, because I hadn't truly had just a brutal downswing in 2022. I waited until the end of the year for it to get here. I did lose 7,000 or so in a week, but if I want to look on the bright side, I made like 50 or 60 bucks in comps. I'd get into Peppermill at around 11 on this Wednesday, but the game wouldn't start at its normal time, with a lot of the guys who can normally be counted on to start the game skipping this day. Good news was, other guys who can be counted on to give action would show up later. And spoiler alert, they'd give it to me. It wouldn't be what I'd call a dream lineup at first. It would be one, though, full of characters you've heard of on this vlog, including Mr. Z, the hippie, and the pro, Turtle Shark, from Lake Tahoe. I start off 3-betting pocket 7s pre-flop in a limp pot. I made it 7.5x and still got called by an opponent with king 6. I only know about that because he flopped a flush draw on queen jack deuce 2 clubs and showed me the hand when I check folded. It's Wednesday, so they do a $100 splash pot every hour and people tend to play absolutely crazy in those. I opened the ace six of diamonds in a splash pot, which I wasn't 100% sure I should do in the first place. And because there was already 100 in, I got called by five hands, including six deuce offsuit, king eight offsuit, three five suited, and the octo crab. <laughs> Ironically, I believe it was the OC that took the pot down. I lose two more small pots and then found myself down 400 out of the gate when this next hand took place. We get a raise to 35 from a tough but pretty tight player in the low jack. I have jack 10 of hearts in the cutoff and make the call. And with 85 in, the flop is 10-6 deuce with a couple of clubs, giving me top pair. Low jack bets 55 here. And with that top pair, I decide to come along, though I didn't feel great about this against this particular opponent. With 195 in, I felt a hell of a lot better about it when the turn came a 10. Low jack bets 75 here, and... I basically was making a player-dependent read when I decided that he would fold a lot of hands to a raise for me in this spot. I also thought there was a non-zero chance that he might still have some bluffs and would continue on with that. And that's why I decided to just call here. And with 345 in, the river is the nine of clubs bringing in the front door draw. I definitely expected him to check a hand like aces or kings here. But instead, he decides to just bet 100. I didn't love the idea of raising, which my initial plan obviously was when I smooth called the turn, now that those front door clubs have come in. I figured that he would still find a lot of folds with weaker hands. But if he happened to have me out kicked here or a better hand in some other fashion, well, then I'm just in for a world of hurt. So I decide to just call that $100 bet, and that created a $545 pot, and he shows kings. So I am not by any means proud of how I played that hand. Make no mistake about it, but I think my read on the opponent and how he would have reacted was probably correct. Mr. Z had an interesting day. He ended up rivering kings full of nines, and his opponent decided to jam all in. Then I played a $40 limped pot from MP2 with ace, seven of diamonds, and the flop came out seven, seven, six rainbow. I tried to check raise Mr. Z, but he didn't bet, nor did the others, because as a ancient Chinese proverb states, you can only check raise when your opponent bets. The turn came the jack of spades. Gets checked to me, and I bet 25 here. Big blind makes the call with the others going out. And with 90 in, the river is an eight, and now, he decides to lead at this for 50. With my trip sevens, I'm still definitely going to raise here, but I'm not going to go too crazy with it. I just make it 125, hoping that hands like King Jack or Queen Jack will look me up here. And he thinks about it for a minute before doing just that, creating a $340 pot. I show my hand, and he mucks. I didn't notice two things. Number one, 
This guy showed up in short shorts. I wouldn't do that in July based on the style factor, but he did it on a day where the high was 32 degrees in Reno. And number two, Mr. Z was in beast mode. He busted the hippie and was now up several thousand dollars on the day. I would lose a few more small pots in which I decided to play some suited connectors semi-aggressively and paid the price for it and ended up doing nothing more than donating about 150. So with suited connectors not getting the job done, I opted to give a suited gapper a shot. It came in a spot where I had a pretty good idea I was getting bluffed. I'm not going to say how I knew that, but I had a good feeling about it, and my plan was to go with the hand if I flopped any pair on most boards, as I was already down several hundred dollars out of my initial $1,000 buy-in. It folds all the way to me on the button with jack nine of spades, and I decide to raise here, which is an obvious open. I make it 30. Mr. Z then three bets to 125 in the big blind, and I elect to make this call. And with 255 in, I flopped two pair, and he wastes absolutely no time putting me all in. It's a snap call to say the least, and that creates just over a $1,000 pot, and he shows the skinny. So my read on the fact that I was getting bluffed ends up being accurate. He would actually turn a club for what would be a deuce high flush draw. <laughs> and that was live. Thankfully, he didn't hit it on the river and that pot gets shipped our way. He wouldn't waste much time getting it back, though, as he played a pot against Turtle, in which he made a sick, thin value bet on the river. Gotta give him credit for it, with just second pair, and got paid off with his $200 wager. This is a mid-session update. As a general policy, I never talk shit to friends or just acquaintances when my sports team beats theirs. But there was a meteorologist here in Reno that always does it to me. He's from Winnipeg, and my Golden Knights happened to sweep his Winnipeg Jets this year. So because he came at me, I texted him this and felt good about it. Local favorites Slick and James, the actual professor, show up to the game. So with the two of them, Turtle and Mr. Z, things were going to get interesting. I'm going to describe this next hand to you in a way that's more conceptual than a formal breakdown. Now, part of the reason for that is that I don't want to reveal my actual thought process in case these guys see this. The other part is that I'm ashamed of myself. The hand was simple. I raised ace-king and got a couple of callers, Mr. Z and Mr. C. I flopped trip kings on king, king, queen. What I ended up doing was betting extremely small on all three streets. Now, one of the reasons for this is that I knew there was a good chance neither had hardly anything, and I wanted to keep them both in. That strategy actually worked well against Mr. Z in this case, as he called me with nothing more than a backdoor flush draw, which he ended up missing. But the hand ended up playing out with Mr. C just calling me all the way down with the case king. I never got a look at his kicker, but I'm still stunned by this. I could have bet double the pot on all three streets and got called, but instead I made the absolute minimum. So what is the concept I'm talking about here? You have to do the bidding for yourself. In this case, I thought it might go the other way, based on a variety of reasons. But don't expect people to bluff you nearly as much as you should expect people to call you. And this hand proves that that even includes the most aggressive players in 2022 live cash game poker. Turtle has the rock straddle under the gun, and MP1 decides to limp in. It folds to me on the button with a couple of red tens. I make it 30 here. Mr. Z decides to come in from the big blind, and the straddle and limper both complete. And with 120 in, the board comes out 10, 8, 6, 2 spades, giving me top set. It gets checked to me, and I decide to just make a standard $50 bet here. Big blind folds, and under the gun, and I'll remind you, this is a pro, 
check raises to 200, and it's back on me. I could definitely slow play this bad boy here, but chances are he's doing this with some equity, and he'll call a raise, allowing me to get more money in right now. Also, if I raise, I have the chance to simply get it in here against smaller sets, which would be ideal to do before any action-killing cards come on the turn. So I decide to 3-bet to 450 here, and he thinks about it for a few seconds before calling. And with 1,020 in, I'm obviously hoping the board pairs, but outside of that, the best case scenario for me, I felt was a high blank to come out there, and that is what I get with the King of Hearts peeling off. He checks, and I only have about half a pot-sized bet left here, so I decide to bet it all, which is an obvious play, and he barely thinks about it for a second before tossing his cards into the muck. I would run out of time, but end up booking the win. All right, just before six o'clock, gotta go pick up my son. Cashing out, booking a win of $706. Didn't have a lot of big hands on the day, so I'll take that as the comeback trail is hopefully in progress. All right, so one of the things that I had been wanting to mention on this blog and, in all honesty, simply forgot to do over the past month or so, and I'm, again, I'm the least superstitious guy <laughs> out there, but it just always seems in poker that when you run really good, it's often at the same time you run really bad in other areas of life and vice versa. I've mentioned briefly at times that, um, you know, like, I'm sure so many of you, I've often struggled in relationships over the years, and uh, there was about a four or five month stretch after my marriage ended where I could not have been running better in that regard. And at the same time, I remember losing money at poker pretty much that entire five month stretch. And then in December of that year, those two things completely flipped. And I bring that up because we recently saw an example of that to the highest level in terms of the run bad that happened here locally. And it got attention throughout the poker world. And that is what happened to a guy by the name of Jared Mingini, who those of you who really know poker and perhaps some of you who really know snowboarding will know that name. And uh, he's been a guy who's been uh, not a regular every week, but plays a lot in the games at the Pepper Mill. Uh, for those of you who remember the vlog I shot last year in a home game at Lake Tahoe, uh, it was at his house. Uh, I think I'm actually playing him in fantasy football uh, this week, but that's neither here nor there. What happened to Jared is something that I obviously can't even imagine being an only child, but even if I wasn't, I, I could not imagine. And that is the fact that uh, his brother uh, was killed in a motorcycle crash several months ago. And I mean, what can you say about that? It's just unimaginable. Uh, but the poker side of it that came into this was about a month and a half or so after that, they had the World Series of Poker Circuit event at Lake Tahoe. $1,700 buy-in, I believe. Uh, pretty good turnout. And he jumped into that and basically said, I'm going to dedicate this run to my late brother. And he just went ahead and won the tournament for over $150,000. And uh, again, this doesn't qualify as running good in one area and running bad in one area because the two things aren't comparable. And I guess I kind of felt myself thinking about the fact that, well, I've never run good enough to even cash in a tournament, let alone win one. But I've never run bad enough to lose a loved one uh, outside of my grandparents. Uh, I've never had a thing like that happen. So I just look at it in the sense of, well, you know, I'm the one who's run good. Now, he won the tournament, but I'm the one who's run good. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, to get that in there. Obviously, even winning millions would not even come close to bringing back one's brother. Uh, but still, the ability to uh, have that happen, I thought was 
you know, at least a nice moment for him and obviously a very uh, cool story in the poker world to say the least. That'll do it for us. Hit those like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. It truly helps out this channel a ton and I genuinely appreciate that. We'll see you back here next time.